and welcome to the program. My name is Vivica Williams and this is Head to Head. The 2014 annexation of Crimea has fundamentally altered Ukraine and not just geographically. What about the people who've been forced to move to mainland Ukraine, leaving the Crimea they call home? Even before the annexation, how Crimeans identified themselves was already quite complex. And now, for those who fled, for those who continue to live under occupation, depending on ethnicity and region, Crimeans are searching for themselves in the larger concept of Ukrainian national identity. And joining us in the studio today to discuss this issue is Austin Sharon, a researcher at the University of Kansas. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So you started, mainly started your research in 2018. What got you started with this idea of Crimean identity? Uh, well, yes, I started this project initially going back to the earliest uh, years in 2008 when I had a Fulbright research grant um, straight out of my undergraduate education. And at that time, I was primarily interested in, in Crimea and uh, particularly why there hadn't been an ethnic conflict there where there had been in other parts of the former Soviet Union, in, in um, Abkhazia, Transistria, South Ossetia. And so that was my initial interest. I may have jumped the gun a little bit with that uh, assessment that there was no ethnic conflict there, which is coming a little later, you might say. Um, but as I was there, I became more interested in the question of identity. And I realized that people in Crimea have a really strong attachment to Crimea itself, mm -hmm. that uh, Crimea as, as a region plays really strongly into their sense of identity, this regional component to their identity. And I began to look at those questions. I had the opportunity to return in 2011 when I was beginning my master's program. Um, and I conducted a survey about uh, concerning questions of identity and their attachment to Crimea, to Ukraine, and to other sort of geographical and territorial constructs. Austin, tell us about what your results were. Tell us what we're seeing here. Sure. Um, there were many questions that I asked in the survey relating to identity and whatnot. But one question I did ask that um, I would say is quite prescient for, for the situation now and for what happened only a few years after I, I did this survey uh, was about how, what Crimeans think uh, Crimea's political status should be, if it should remain uh, as, as it is, as it was at the time, an autonomous region of mm -hmm. Ukraine, if it should lose that autonomy, or if it should become a part of Russia, either as an autonomous region huh. uh, or a non-autonomous region, an oblast, if you will, or to become independent or anything else. And um, results were quite interesting, and I think they actually do a lot to dispel some of the ideas that were swirling in 2014 at the time of the so-called referendum that happened there uh, and the so-called results that came out of that referendum mm -hmm. about how overwhelmingly people there apparently wanted to be a part of Russia. My results from only uh, a couple of years before show, uh, showed, in fact, that there were uh, there was strong support for remaining a part of Ukraine, especially maintaining autonomy. Even mm -hmm. among ethnic Russians, um, there was still rather strong support among a, a, a one segment of the, of the ethnic Russian population in Crimea to remain a part of Ukraine. So um, the situation may have changed, of course, given the Euromaidan and everything that happened in the years after my survey. But um, I think there's a lot there that really raises questions about the results of that survey, of that refer referendum that was held in 2014. So it's showing, what, what, what I'm seeing there is it's showing that uh, this identity idea is, is very complex, but also that Crimeans are very attached to the idea of Crimea. Absolutely. Than, uh, uh, and one of the interesting results from that particular aspect of the survey was that um, more so than the Russia versus Ukraine question, the question of autonomy versus non-autonomy really stood out as an important component there, and that overwhelmingly people said, whether or not they're part of Ukraine or Russia, that they prefer to uh, maintain an autonomous status. And that means a lot of things. You know, it means having some sort of say locally over the policies and the politics of what's happening in Crimea. But I've also argued um, in some of the work I've done that recognizing the autonomy of Crimea is a way of also recognizing its sort of special character yeah. and the, what, what it means to people to be from there to have this, this special attachment to it. And um, I, autonomy is um, something of a symbolic status that they maintain and that, that gives them this, this idea that, oh, we are from a special place that has these special regulations and, and rules applied to it. Well, then let's jump forward then. Sure. I think it's like six years mm -hmm. or le probably five years. And you came back to Ukraine to continue your research in 2015, is mm -hmm. that correct? And you, so you stayed with the idea of Crimean identity, but it took a different role. Mm -hmm. now. Uh, yes, given the changes that occurred um, following the Euromaidan and the uh, annexation of Crimea soon thereafter, 
um, I became interested in the new questions about identity that arose from that, especially related to people from Crimea especially. Of course, Crimea was annexed. It became de facto part of, the, of Russia at that time. But there are many who decided to leave Crimea voluntarily uh, to come to the mainland of Ukraine um, rather than to live under Russian occupation there. And I became very interested in these same questions of identity. What does it mean now for people from Crimea to be outside of Crimea, um, to be in the mainland of Ukraine, given everything that's happened? Many have left their families behind. Many have, have had to leave of their own volition and, and on, in many cases, under dire circumstances. Um, and within this, my primary focus, I would say, has been on the Crimean Tatars, who right. have a very special place within Crimea, for whom Crimea is absolutely their homeland. They have no other homeland but Crimea. Yeah. And the decision to leave Crimea for the home for the mainland of Ukraine is necessarily a very difficult one for many, uh, but also a, a necessary choice for many who, who really can't continue living under the harsh repression and the, har the harsh conditions that are happening there nowadays. And were you able to follow up with some of the same people you interviewed uh, from 2011, have you met or been able to follow up with any of those people? There are some. There are some friends I had made uh, in Crimea in 2008, 2009, again in 2011. Some of my uh, closer friends have left and are now living uh, in Ukraine, both in Kiev and Lviv, the two sites where I've done my, my more recent um, research. And so it has been very interesting to to catch up with them, to see how their lives have changed, how their perceptions of, of their own identity, the role of Crimea, the role of Ukraine. Um, are now ongoing and, and changing with, with the, the circumstances that, that are now, that they now face. And so that's a good question. What, what are they seeing? What are they feeling? What are we seeing with this change in identity? Um, well, I think, as it is for a lot of people in Ukraine, from what I hear, not just for Crimeans, but uh, the country since the Euromaidan has, has undergone a tremendous change, of course. Uh, and there's, a, along with that, you know, the political and economic changes, there's a real bolstering of, of Ukrainian civic identity, not necessarily just ethnic identity, being ethnically Ukrainian, but being civically Ukrainian, being a citizen of the Ukrainian state. And for those people from Crimea who have chosen to leave, that's a, a very important component of their identity. The fact not only that they're Crimean, but now that they are Ukrainian too. And not just now that this is a new thing that's happening, but for many of them, it's been there all along. I think that's something that um, has been overlooked in a lot of the media that's been published about Crimea in the wake of the annexation. There's this assumption, oh, everybody there is pro-Russian, it's very ethnically Russian, a vast majority wish, you know, never really took to Ukraine, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but from what my research tells me and what anecdotally I see talking to so many people is that Ukraine really did mean a lot to them. Uh, and that's in large part guided their choice to leave Crimea and to maintain, um, you know, their Ukrainianness by living on the mainland now. And that's certainly true of many of the friends that I've made there. Wow. And now, I also know that last year you actually appeared in what I call a docudrama mm -hmm. that was done by the Ministry of Information Policy here mm -hmm. called Crimea the Resistance. Mm -hmm. So how did that come about? Um, well, through my research and through my um, attempts to make contacts and to find people to interview, I was put in touch with uh, the deputy, um, the first deputy minister at the uh, Ministry of Information Policy, who is a Crimean Tatar, and who had been planning this this uh, docudrama that they wanted to film. They were looking for uh, somebody to sort of star as the uh, the the main role of, of the American or Western researcher who is there doing research about the Crimean Tatars and about the annexation and, and everything that's that's happened since. And so after we became acquainted, she asked if I would be willing to star in this film. It sounded very interesting, so I, I happily agreed. Um, and um, I think it turned out pretty well, actually. Okay. Well, let's see. We have a, uh, we have a clip from uh, an outtake from Crimea, the resistance. So it looks like this kind of mirrors your actual research on what you were really doing here. Um, in a way, it was similar. When I when they first approached me, I was under the impression that they were actually interested in, in um, highlighting the research that I was actually doing. But once we began discussing the project, I, I came to understand that they were looking for something more specific, that they sort of had a, a script and a, and a specific role in mind for me. And in order to maintain some distance between the character in that film and my own research, to, so that, you know, it's not my name attached to the research right. being presented in the film, I, I asked to sort of use a different name. So it's not exactly me in the film, but it's a character based in large part on me. me. Yeah. And But you did have uh, an opportunity to have what I figure is probably a remarkable conversation with one particular guy in the mm -hmm. film. Uh, are you speaking of Mustafa Jimilas? Yes. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, the uh, sort of de facto leader of the Crimean Tatar people, also a member of the uh, Ukrainian Vekhovna Rada. Um, he is a very remarkable figure. This was my second time getting to meet with him and interview him for this uh, docudrama. Um, he is a, a, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. He's gone through a whole lot um, to you know, promote the right of his people to live in their homeland and to return from their deportation from, the, from 1944. And he continues to struggle and to fight for the rights of his people now in this, uh, in the new context of the, the annexation of Crimea and, and what it's meant for, for the Crimean Tatars since then. Um, it was a very um, interesting moment to be there interviewing him, actually. We happened to be there on the night uh, that Jamala first performed <laughs> in the um, local uh, competition for Eurovision, ultimately to go on to perform in the national competition. When we arrived, he was very nervous and very excited to watch her perform. Uh, we had to we set up all the, the equipment for the interview, but we had to wait until after she performed before we began because she he wanted to be sure that we that we were able to watch her interview. And so you see it in the in the film itself. Actually, we, that's really us watching her perform. Um, performed the song 1944 for the very first time live. And, so this uh, is a very his, unscripted moment. Yeah, and his reaction is, is very powerful, as, as you can see. So what would you say to people, what would be one of the takeaways about how to look at Crimeans and how Crimeans think about themselves? Because as you said, it is very complex mm -hmm. and we tend to like to make things in black and white. Mm -hmm. So what is some, what's a takeaway we can get from this with IDPs? I would say that uh, the IDPs represent just one segment of the population of Crimea that I would say is ultimately pro-Russian. So we, they're the ones who have been able to actually leave you, uh, Crimea for the Ukrainian mainland. There are many still uh, in Crimea who silently support Ukraine, who are not able to speak out. You know, the law has, uh, is very restrictive now. Um, Russian law in Crimea basically dictates that no challenge to Russia's mm -hmm. territorial integrity, which it includes in that instance, Crimea, no challenge can be voiced against it uh, under penalty of law. Mm -hmm. So there's a real uh, struggle for people there who are pro-Ukrainian, who, who do not support the occupation there, to, um, to remain silent. So I would like to say that not only are those here on the mainland of Ukraine from Crimea supportive of the, of the Ukrainian state, and very much so, there are still many in, in Crimea who support it, um, but who are unable to really make their voices heard. Thank you so much for being with us today, Austin. Thank you for having Thank me. You. This has been Vivica Williams with UATV, and we were speaking today with Austin Chiron about Crimean identity. Thank you for watching.